we'd like to combine some of the uh, elements we've seen on escape rates on the one hand and mixing on the other hand. Um, so, uh, so our setting will be, we'll have a graph G. Um, so it will be uh, connected and undirected and it will be a simple graph meaning no no multiple edges and no self loops we will consider the markov chain will be simple random walk or lazy simple random walk both of them will work on g <coughs> and uh, and the, the goal is to compare mixing time to uh, the diameter. So for any graph, we have a natural graph metric. The distance between two nodes is the length of the shortest path between them. <coughs> the diameter of the graph is just the maximal distance between two nodes and we want to see how that relates to the mixing time so <coughs> in, so in general without conditions you cannot bound the mixing time from if above so the diameter will denote by capital D above uh, using D because if you have a graph like a graph the type we mentioned so here is a complete graph this is a complete graph on n over two nodes so all the edges are present and here is another copy of the complete graph on n over two nodes and we connect two of these nodes by a single edge then the mixing time uh, here will be very large, in fact, order n squared. So, <clears throat> yet uh, the diameter of this graph is just three. Right? You can get from any node to any other node. So, <clears throat> um, so to see that, in, at least intuitively, why the mixing time here is n squared, uh, let me explain. So. If I st suppose I start with some node here, <coughs> and let's take epsilon equals a quarter, so we want to understand T mix, which is T mix of a quarter. So if I start here, then <coughs> um, I can look at this target set A. So it has measure one half, so it's the, the set on the right. And I can ask how long until PTXA Right, for, for, to get to this mixing time, we need PTXA to be close to one half. So we need to have a substantial chance to reach this side. Now, so the first question is, how long does it take to reach this side? So to reach this side, I fir the only chance I have is via this vertex, this connecting vertex. And this vertex I visit with each time I go to it with probability about, uh, about 1 over n, uh, 1 over n over 2 minus 1, but order 1 over n. So, it w so starting from x, it will take me about n steps or about n over 2 till I first visit here. But each time I visit here, I'm not guaranteed to cross. Quite the contrary. Each time I, I'm here, the particle sees only one edge going right, and it sees you know, n over two edges going left. So the chance, even when it is here, the chance it will make the crossing is only one over n, or two over n. So, so you have to wait for a rare event with probability two over n, but even that is only not guarantee of success. You need for a double kind of a doubly rare event to happen, which has probability a constant over n squared or four over n squared. Namely, you need to visit this vertex and then take this step. So it's easy to see by comparison to a geometric variable that 
um, this will take order n squared. So if I wait for a time which is a small constant times n squared, you know, n squared over 10, then the chance is rather small, n squared over 100, if we don't care about the constants here, then the chance is rather small that in this time I will have crossed to a. So pt xa minus uh, pi of a will be in absolute value uh, larger than a quarter. So the mixing time here is <laughs> at least n squared. On the other hand, it's easy to see that the mixing time really is of order n squared. So we write comparable to n squared. And this we can see, for instance, using the coupling method. So we start with two, two particles. And the, the worst case is when they are both on different sides. And they start walking. And the same argument as before says that by time n squared, one of them will, is likely to cross to the other side. It's very small probability that they will both, uh, that, uh, they will both cross. So first, one will cross. And it's, it's, I mean, it's small probability they will cross at the same time. So when the first time one of them crosses, say x first reaches here, after they are in the same side, they will couple, we can uh, couple them very quickly. If we run them independently, they will couple in n more steps. But in fact, we're allowed to choose any coupling. So we can, in fact, couple them in a, essentially one more step once they are on the same side. So, but getting to the same side, that really takes order n squared. So the mixing time here is n squared. So there is no upper bound. <laughs> However, uh, we will see for for Cayley graphs, a T mix is going to be bounded by a constant times the degree times d squared, okay, times uh, log n. <laughs> So, <coughs> so, in a K, so uh, what is a Cayley graph? A uh, Cayley graph is obtained is obtained from from a, a group. So, we have a, a group which is finitely generated by some set of generators S. And uh, what we do is the vertices, we take x and y in the group, and they are connected if x is in y times s. And s is a set of generators of the group. So, um, so here I'm uh, assuming uh, people uh, you know, have some, some background in group theory. But let me say that what's important for us in the Cayley graph structure is the, uh, it's what's called transitivity. A Cayley graph has the property that all vertices look the same, which for this formally means for any two vertices of the Cayley graph, there is a graph homomorphism that takes one vertex to the other one. Uh, but, so Cayley graphs, uh, there are a lot of them because there are a lot of uh, finite groups. Um, so, you know, classical examples are permutation groups and various uh, group, subgroups of permutations, but you know, go to your uh, favorite algebraist and he will tell you about many other interesting groups. Uh, the ones that are simplest to visualize are uh, the lattices, uh, the tori, and, uh, and there are of course many infinite groups as well, uh, free groups. <laughs> um, I will maybe mention one other interesting example later, which is called the lamplighter group. But for now, I want to say, I just mentioned this. We'll come back to this point. But um, this is about upper bound. So, um, so if the usually we're interested in graphs where the degree is small or logarithmic. Um, and here, so we have some a degree factor, a log n factor, and the main term here is this diameter squared. So this is uh, often a good bound, but not always. So if we look at the case of the cycle that we looked at before, then there this uh, bound is reasonable. We know the truth there is the mixing time is n squared. And this will give 
an n squared uh, log n. In fact, this bound is based on the bound for the relaxation time. The relaxation time is at most um, you know, 2 times d squared times the degree. And then once you know that, you easily get the bound for the mixing time because of the relation we discussed between the mixing and the relaxation time. Um, for, for this to hold, without further conditions, you really need to consider the lazy simple random walk because some uh, groups, uh, for some groups, the Cayley graphs are bipartite, so the random walk itself will not mix. You need to consider the lazy simple random walk. Okay, so we'll come back to this point, but now I want to talk a little about lower bounds for the mixing time using diameter. So there is one trivial lower bound which says that the, uh, the mixing, that say for, for epsilon, which is less than a half, the mixing time is at least the diameter over two. And this is because if this is our graph, here are two points x and z that are diametrically opposite, so their distance is exactly d, then if we look at any time which is less than the half the diameter, then when I start from x, I can only reach the points that are closer to x. When I start from z, I can only reach the points that are closer to z. So um, if, I, if I define this set A, say, which are the points why so that the distance maybe i want to call the distance now rho so rho will be rho will be the graph distance so if i look at the set a which are points y so that the distance from y to x is at least d over 2 so this is the set a here so these are points distance at least d over 2. Then <coughs> a PTXA is going to be 0 for T, which is less than d over 2. <coughs> but if I look here at the set A complement, I have to continue. Do people see down what's down there, or is it uh, hidden? So again, let me redraw this picture. This is x. This is z. We're going to reuse this picture for a less trivial bound in a moment. So this was the set A. A was the points uh, y, so that the distance from y to x was at least d over 2. Then you know, p t x a was 0 for t which is less than d over 2. You cannot get there. On the other hand, if you look at a complement over here, the complement is contained in the set of y's so that the distance from y to z is bigger than d over 2. Right? Because the complement is exactly the set of y's so that the distance from y to x is less than d over 2. And if a point had distance to x less than d over 2 and distance to z less than d over 2, we would get a contradiction from triangle inequality. So we have this containment. And so since a complement is contained in this, the same reason gives pt of z a complement is also 0. So if we look at the quantity d bar of t I defined last time, so what was d bar of t? It's the maximum over all choices of xz of, a, of this quantity pt xa. It's the maximum over all choices of x and z of the total variation distance. So it's bigger than pt xa minus pt za in absolute value. But this is 0 and this is 1. So Yes, so d bar of t was defined as the maximum over all pairs x, z of starting points of the total variation distance of, of the distribution at time t starting from x. 
and the distribution at time t starting from z. And the total variation distance itself is the maximum over sets A of this. So the total variation distance is just the maximum over all choices of x, z, and A of the right-hand side here. But this is 1. So in fact, so we get that for this t, d bar of t is, uh, is, is 1. And then that implies, remember that d bar was big, d bar of t was uh, bigger than d of t, but was smaller than twice d of t just from triangle inequality. So just using that right-hand inequality, you get that d bar of t is at least a half. OK, so this is the, I'm sorry, the d of t is at least a half. So the mixing time, uh, for a, the mixing time is at least the diameter over 2. So that's the trivial bound. And, but it turns out we can use essentially the same picture together with the veropoulos karn bound to get something better. Now, I said this is a trivial bound. There are cases where this trivial bound is, is attained. One example are the so-called expander graphs. So, so expander graphs are graphs of bounded degree where the relaxation time is order one. In other words, there is a spectral gap. So these are, I won't have time to construct them for you, but expander graphs, or just expanders, uh, so these are, it's really, to, to, it's really more precise to talk about an expander sequence. So these are graphs GN where the degrees are bounded. The size, say GN has size N, so the size goes to infinity and the spectral gap is bounded below. Or in other words, the relaxation time of, say, the lazy simple random walk should be bounded above. So it's not an obvious fact that expander graph sequences exist. Uh, again, so with this definition, I'm saying that something is bounded. So for a fixed graph, everything is bounded. So, in the, so really, you should talk about an expander graph sequence. One, what? I didn't. I didn't. OK, so I emphasize. OK. I, I sh maybe I switched uh, <coughs> upper bounds need the Cayley graph. And I, I w I'm delaying the upper bounds to later. They're more sophisticated. Lower bounds don't need any Cayley graph assumption. Okay? So sorry I was you know, shifting. But I wanted to give you a preview. We will prove later. And I gave an example showing that uh, there is no upper bound, no reasonable upper bound on the mixing time using the diameter because the diameter could be 3 and the mixing time can be huge and squared. <coughs> For Cayley graphs, there will be a good upper bound, but I'm delaying that to later. And then I'm shifting gears and talking about lower bounds. So there is a easy lower bound of diameter over 2, which I explained. And this uh, easy, trivial lower bound is sometimes sharp. And an example where it's sharp are these uh, expander graphs. So these are graphs of bounded degree. You can take them to have degree 3. And um, <laughs> uh, yet they have a spectral gap bounded below or relaxation time bounded above. So the first example of expander graphs uh, was was actually constructed by Pinsker in Russia around the early 70s. And the construction was you take a n over 2 vertices here, n over 2 vertices here, and combine three random permutations. So you take a permutation from the left side to the right side. Okay, and you just take three random permutations. Or you could take two random permutations and one just the identity. That's, that's good enough. So by combining this, you get a three regular graph. Every vertex has three neighbors on the other side. Um, since we combine three permutations, there's some chance this, this will uh, create multiple edges, but with a um, substantial probability, a probability bounded away from zero, there will be no multiple edges here. So with a substantial probability, you can calculate this will give you a legitimate simple graph with no, certainly there are no loops, no self-loops. 
and with, high, with substantial probability there are no multiple edges, so with some constant probability that goes to a constant. So if you look at this event, you get a random graph, and what uh, Pinsker showed is that with high probability, this graph will be an expander. So um, although at the time, the different notions of ex the, um, he didn't use the spectral gap definition, he used the, uh, the, uh, the expansion definition, so there is an equivalent definition of expansion, a uh, more combinatorial. It, um, it took until the 80s to get uh, deterministic constructions of expanders, and the most famous is the lubosky philip sarnak ramanujan graphs. I will uh, show you some pictures of those in the last lecture uh, tomorrow. But these graphs have a um, relaxation time order 1, so that means the mixing time is order log n by the kind of bounds uh, we discussed yesterday. Um, and uh, they also have a diameter which is log n. Certainly any graph of bounded degree cannot have a diameter which is smaller than order log n. And <laughs> so these graphs have diameter and mixing time both order log n. So it shows that this can bound can be sharp up to constant. But in many uh, cases it is uh, not satisfactory. So let's see a better bound. So, better bound, um, T mix is bigger than diameter squared over constant, I'll put 16, but uh, this constant is not optimal, T mix is bigger than diameter squared over constant log n. So, if you're ignoring logarithmic factor, it tells you that diameter squared is a uh, is a lower bound, okay, and then there is this log n correction. If we, so again, the same example of expander graphs, uh, you know, this, for expander graphs, this bound is the same as before, um, but for most graphs, the diameter is bigger than log n, and then this bound is better than before. And again, log n is the minimal possible diameter if we're talking about graphs of bounded degree. Um, so, so usually this bound is better than the previous one. So let's, let's prove it. So we're going to conveniently use the same picture I have on the right board, the same set A and A complement, but we were just going to give a better estimate for PTXA. So remember, the veropoulos karn bound, so it says ptxy is less than root pi. So, okay, so this is the more general bound than what I proved, but I assume you've all uh, used the time to look in the uh, lecture notes or in the book that has the general proof. One second. So we have e to the minus um, a factor of two, e to the minus rho, of, rho squared of xy, over 2t. So that's, a, so that's the Veropoulos current bound we're going to use. Uh, Krishna, you had a comment? Yeah, the, the key mix is for fixed epsilon. Yes. So that's right. So we, we j then it's a different game, but usually we fix epsilon. So, uh, yeah, so I didn't, uh, I, so when I write T mix and I don't write what is epsilon, I mean epsilon is a quarter. Uh, th this, was, this was a convention. But, um, but if you want to be more, let's be more precise. So this is true. Okay, this is true 
a, for, for epsilon strictly less than a half, provided n is large enough. Okay, so for any epsilon less than a half, this is true. If n is large enough, bigger than some n sub epsilon. Okay, so this is a more precise. Okay, so we're going to use this bound. Uh, and uh, so if the graph is regular, if all the degrees are the same, then this factor is 1. Otherwise, this factor is at most root n because the largest, since we have a simple graph, all the degrees are at least, and it's connected, all the degrees are at least 1 and at most n. So I can write in, in our graph case, this is a small 2 root n, e to the minus rho squared xy over 2t. <coughs> so I'm going to use the same, I won't repeat, so I want to use the same sets A and A complement defined here. So this is A, A complement is contained in, in that set. So we're going to look at our graph as before, fix two nodes x and z that have their distance maximal, rho x z equals d. We have some points, such point D. We define the set A as before. And now we want to uh, get a better bound for PTXA. So we're just going to sum over the elements of A. I don't know what is the size of A, but it's certainly at most N. So let's put, uh, so we can put here two N three halves, E to the minus. Now this factor in all points, so I want to write D, squared over 8t, because this, uh, because rho of xy is at least d over 2 for y and a. That's the definition of a. Right? So, so this is, uh, this is what we have. Yes? N, over n to the power 3 by 2. N to the 3 over 2, because we have root n here and n from the size of A. So PTXA, we are summing over all elements of A, this bound up here. Okay? Anything else not clear? I, I jumped a step, but I hope it's okay. Summing over the elements of A. Um, so now, <laughs> so the idea of the choice of T, so here is, So if we take a, for t which is less than d squared over um, 16 log n, we get that ptxa, so we're going to just plug in this value of t, the d squared cancels, and the and we get, well, let me write it, 2n to the 3 halves, e to the minus a 2 log n. In other words, we get 2 over root n. Okay? Please stop me if something is unclear. Okay, now the same argument gives that if I look at PT of Z and A complement, again, all the points in A complement have distance at least D over 2 from Z. So exactly the same considerations tell us that this is also less than 2 over root N. So now if we look at D bar of T, it's bigger than PT of Z A minus P T of X A. But um, P T of Z A is at least, at least uh, 1 minus 2 over root N. So, so we get that this is bigger than 1 minus 4 over root N. Because from this inequality, we have that P T of Z A 
must be at least 1 minus 2 over root n. Okay, so, so we have this, so d of t is bigger than a half minus 2 over root n. Okay, so if n is large enough, this is going to be bigger than epsilon, because we assumed epsilon is less than a half. Okay, so that proves this, this inequality. Okay. And if epsilon is like a quarter, then the n that you need is not, is not very large, right? You just need 2 over root n to be less than a quarter. Any questions about this? So as, <laughs> as simple as this uh, proof is from Vropoulos Karn, it's, um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not something that's, really obtainable by other means. So the bound of, it's, it's a pretty good bound. Uh, there are many examples where diameter squared is the right order of mixing, though it's not always. And uh, this, this gives you the diameter squared with this log correction. So um, it again shows the power of the veropoulos karn inequality. Yes? I'm going to take you back to the first step. How yes. Okay, so I said that what I'm considering is not a general Markov chain, it's now simple random walk or lazy simple random walk on a graph. So we have to uh, recognize what is this stationary distribution for such a walk, and that is just the degrees. So if you look at the vector of degrees, then uh, you can check immediately the reversibility condition. So pi y, px y equal is just, uh, if you take pi, which is a degree, then you get uh, pi y px y is just 1. So it's true. And so you get reversibility. So, uh, so the vector of the degrees is a reversible and hence stationary measure for the Markov chain, which is simple random walk, and it also applies to lazy simple random walk. Okay? So, then the, so then what we're using is the ratio of degrees is at most n because we have a simple graph. We don't allow multiple edges. Okay, any other questions? Um, all right, so, So I'm going to move on to upper bounds. So I want to state a theorem about transitive graphs. I'll only prove it in the case of Cayley graphs. This is, on the one hand, it's a theorem that appeared in Annals of Probability just uh, a, f a couple of years ago, but I can present the main idea here, and it's a theorem about the rate of escape in a Cayley graph. So if G, or a transitive graph, if G is a, so, so maybe let G, let G be a, finite or infinite, a Cayley 
or more generally transitive graph okay and what I want to look at is the rate of escape um, so let's write the degree equals d so uh, these graphs are automatically regular the degree of every vertex is the same if it's a Cayley graph the degree is the size of the set of generators we're using and <laughs> we need to look at the expected distance okay from x0 to xt so so xt will be the simple random walk t is the time parameter we need to look at the expected distance squared um, and we want to sh show, say that um, something about, about this. So expected distance squared is at least okay, t over d if g is infinite. If g is finite, I need a condition t is at most t rel. Okay, so this is a case where the statement for infinite graphs is much is much cleaner than for finite. But in this case, the proof for finite graphs is a little simpler. So I will. Uh, focus on the proof for finite but the statement in infinite graphs is uh, now um, one <coughs> so <coughs> um, okay so let's look at infinite Cayley graphs of course the most familiar are z and zd and there we know that the expected distance squared grows linearly in time it's natural to guess that uh, these are the slowest groups and this theorem says this is essentially true but um, when we think of how to prove that um, natural approach is to say well if I'm in Z or in ZD it's always true that wherever I am at least half my neighbors are further from the starting point than my current locations so so I can just couple my walk to a walk on Z and say that the distance is always growing this is true in ZD but it definitely is false in general Cayley graphs. So there is kind of an amazing uh, fact of group theory, which says there are Cayley graphs with dead ends. So what is a dead end? So we have this Cayley graph. A dead end is a vertex where all its neighbors are closer to the identity than the vertex itself. So there is no way to go further. Every step, everywhere you go, gets you closer to the identity. So it's kind of shocking that these dead ends exist and in fact they exist in a bad way there are some vertices where every neighbor is closer to the identity and moreover if you want to get further from the identity you have to go quite a distance closer before you can have a chance to go further so they really have these deep dead ends deep cul-de-sacs and to think that this is possible in a transitive graph is very surprising I'll show you some examples later but this means that this coupling approach to prove lower bounds for distance is really doomed <coughs> and um, another approach is to use a, what's called heat kernel or transition probability bounds so we can say well one reason the walk has to escape is if we can say the probability of any specific point is small so it has to um, so it, the walk cannot stay confined in a small ball and that approach can work but it only gives a lower bound of t to the one-third on the expected distance or t to the two-thirds on the and the distance squared so this is quite a sophisticated approach again due to Veropoulos and continued by many others but it doesn't give a sharp bound so for a long time a people like me who you know spend most of their time thinking about random walks were puzzled because we know um, 
all the examples we knew and, and all the examples all our friends uh, algebraists could produce um, had lower bound of root t, but the proofs uh, that were based on heat kernel bounds and isoparametric profiles only gave this t to the one third. So how to get such a bound? The idea came from a French uh, mathematician, Anna Erschler, who suggested to use a method called the mock embedding theorem. So I'm not going to uh, tell you the, the, the details of that because in the end we found an elementary approach. But the mock embedding theorem says that uh, amenable groups can be um, embedded into Hilbert space in a, by an equivariant Lipschitz map. And uh, so the rough idea is to take the random walk, map it by some miraculous harmonic equivariant mapping into Hilbert space. This harmonic map will take the Cayley graph, will map it into Hilbert space in such a way that the random walk will map to a martingale in this Hilbert space. And then for martingales, we can easily compute L2 norms using <coughs> orthogonality of increments and get the result. So it was really kind of an amazing approach, especially as the mock embedding theorem was um, considered quite deep. But um, so after we got this hint from Anna Erschler, uh, James Lee, who is a computer scientist, but also a probabilist at the University of Washington, and I were very puzzled. We thought, well, there should be some more direct explanation, and we found one, but it's not really independent of Anna's ideas. It's inspired by Anna's suggestion. So let me tell you how this goes. Um, so, so in the infinite case, there is a technicality, which is that you also need either, uh, either G amenable or, or T large. I'm not going to focus on the infinite case so much, uh, but okay. So, um, so the, so the key lemma we will use will uh, is based on a method of of spectral embedding which is extremely useful now, both in uh, probability and in computer science and clustering problems and so on. So the idea is instead of using some mapping into a infinite dimensional Hilbert space, we're going to map into Euclidean space using some eigenfunctions of the chain. That's, what, uh, that's what's going to come. So, but, but first, what is the statement? We're going to take given a function f in L, it's going to be a function in L2 of G. So G is our graph or our group. We're going to identify um, the graph and the group. Now, L2 of G, well, if G is infinite, it means, well, functions from the group to R, which are square summable. If G is finite, it just means all functions from G to R. They're all in L2 of G. Um, we're going to define the Dirichlet form, so maybe I'll call it ET. For, so this is the energy form, the Dirichlet energy uh, at time T of F. <coughs> and it's, um, okay, so this is, has a two equivalent definitions. So it's it's uh, so p is our transition matrix i minus p f multiplied by f i should stop soon right what 10 20 okay so e t of f is this what p to the t thank you expectation of the distance squared from x0 to xt 
is is at least uh, 1 over d, so d was the degree, times um, e t of f over uh, e1 of f. So, okay, so I'm assuming here that f is not constant because for constant f, uh, you know, e1 is going to be zero, but um, so let's see first. So, again, I hope it's clear what I'm doing here. This is. I'm taking p to the t apply and i minus p to the t applying to f and taking inner product with f. This is just inner product in L2 of g. So this is just, there's no a pi here. The measure is just counting measure. So this is just a sum. <coughs> so first, um, let's see, um, let's deduce the theorem in the finite case. So note that this theorem, this lemma can be applied to any function f. Um, and the proof of this lemma will based, uh, be based on the spectral embedding. Uh, what's easiest for me to show now before the break is how we can use this lemma. So in the finite case, let's um, Apply this lemma with f, which is an eigenfunction. So take uh, pf equals lambda f, and we're going to take uh, lambda to be the second eigenvalue, or the largest eigenvalue in absolute value, and just apply it for this f. We can take f to be normalized in L2 of g. OK, so uh, that doesn't matter. In this case, what is et of f? So you see the formula here. Now it's just 1 minus lambda to the t ff. So it's just 1 minus lambda to the t. Which we can factor. So the lemma tells us that the expected this row squared of x0 xt is at least this sum <laughs> but now we are assuming t is at most t rel which is 1 over 1 minus lambda so that means that lambda is bigger than 1 minus 1 over t. <clears throat> right, so if you just, right, so this is bigger than 1 over d times the sum 1 minus 1 over t to the j, j equals 0 to t minus 1. And now you can do this uh, efficiently or, uh, or less efficiently, let's do it generously. So 1 minus 1 over t to the j is bigger than 1 minus j over t. And uh, this is a sum that we can do. We get t from this and at most uh, t t over 2 from this, so this is bigger than t over 2d. If you're a little more careful than this constant of a half, you can improve a little bit, um, you know, some like 1 minus 1 over e, but we don't care about that too much. Uh, so that proves this statement given the lemma. But so we'll continue with the lemma 
uh, after the break. Um, yes, or you can think of the you can think of the lazy walk where lambda is uh, bigger than bigger than zero, or take the absolute values. Yes. If in pra uh, now one thing to notice, if lambda is not so in most uh, in most cases the relaxation time has to tend to infinity, so one minus lambda will, so the lambda will tend to, uh, lambda two will be very close to one. So you really don't, so this argument, what, um, what matters is really lambda two, not the biggest lambda in absolute value, but really lambda two. The one that's closest to one is what, what matters. Uh, and so, so really, that's what one should consider here, and not the one. If if it's even if the graph is bipartite, so it means there's an eigenvalue of minus one. What we would need to consider is the second largest eigenvalue, not an absolute value, but really just the second, the the one that's closest to one. Okay, so we'll continue after the break.